Good evening. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome you here tonight uh, to this fourth annual lecture in memory of Professor Sir Roger Dowell, uh, which will be given by Professor Anand Menon. This annual memorial lecture is organized by City University London, the Social Research Association, Natsen Social Research and the British Academy in recognition of the outstanding contribution that Sir Roger Dowell made to the social sciences. And in many ways, there's never been a more critical time to honor Sir Roger Dowell's work on his life work on British attitudes, now in this aftermath of the Brexit referendum. And for those of you who stayed up late enough last night and who don't have anything better to do than to watch Sky's Battle for Number 10, uh, you will have heard that Theresa May was asked by Jeremy Paxman why she would fight for a Brexit that she didn't even believe in. And you will have heard that she answered that this is because that is what the British people want. <laughs> but what do the British people want? That's, of course, a crucial question given that while the government was given a mandate to leave the European Union, they weren't necessarily given a mandate for how and what kind of Brexit to achieve. And so Roger Dahl was crucial in establishing the kind of scientific infrastructures and surveys that allow us to answer that question of what the public thinks about key public policy issues in a rigorous and systematic way. As you will know, among his many achievements are that he established the British Social Attitudes Survey and co-directed the British Election Study. He was the founding chair of the International Social Survey Program. He initiated the establishment of Social Research Association, and he established the European Social Survey, EESS, uh, at City University London in 2001. And these are the kind of surveys and data infrastructures that allow many scholars like myself to examine the questions that are so pertinent to British and European democracy today. What do the people want? What do they expect from politicians? And these are all part of Sir Roger's impressive and lasting legacy. Now, I cannot imagine a better person to reflect on this crossroad in British and in European democracy created by the Brexit vote than Professor Anand Menon. He's Professor of King's College London, and he's also Director of the highly successful ESRC-funded initiative, UK in a Changing Europe, that brings expert opinion, I was going to say to the ignorant masses, but to wider public. And I think... Um, He's better than anyone else I know in explaining the intricacies and complexities of Brexit in an accessible and even, dare I say it, entertaining manner. So I'm delighted to introduce you to <laughs> Professor Anand Menon. Thank you, Sarah, for that kind introduction for setting the bar quite as high as you did. Uh, thank you to the organisers. I should start off by saying I didn't know Roger Jowell. I knew of him, of course. Uh, his was one of the first books. Heath Jowell and Curtis was one of the first books I had to read as I made my rather uncomfortable progression from the world of international relations to the world of uh, political science. And I've spent some time over the last few weeks talking to people such as Denise Leavesley, who sadly couldn't be here today, and of course John Curtis, about Roger. Uh, and everything I've heard made me feel slightly more fraudulent than I already was for standing here to give a lecture dedicated to someone who made such a massive contribution to the social sciences. Incidentally, if you don't know where John Curtis is sitting, you'll be able to work it out, because by the end of this lecture, I will not have looked in his direction once, because <laughs> a number of times over the last 18 months when I've been giving a talk about British politics, I've caught sight of John in the audience shaking his head at me, <laughs> and have found it just so profoundly unnerving that I shall try and avoid doing that this evening. But as I was saying, I feel slightly fraudulent standing here, partly because of Roger Giles, the weight of his contribution to social science, partly because of the nature of it. Those who know me will know very well that I consider it a triumph of quantitative social science if I get the page number function in Word to operate successfully. Uh, I've never been one for working with data, so I should put that up front and centre. If that's what you're here for, then I apologise in advance. So, talking about him, I thought, what could linkers. I mean, the first and most obvious thing for me was his obsession with cricket, which I share. I learned that he liked to stay up late at night to follow results from around the world, which I also share. And I would like to ask those close to him, once we've finished, 
whether he, like I, failed the Tebbit test totally and utterly. But also, more substantively, I know that Europe was close to his heart, and I know that he would have shared my fascination with whatever it is that is going on with British politics at the moment. And finally, of course, part of the reason Roger Jal made his name was that he worked in teams. He created, in some sense, the idea of cross-national or even national teams of social scientists working together. And that's what I like to think to do, we are doing with the UK in a changing Europe. Though, and it is an important rider, I do not associate him with the kind of rampant plagiarism that is about to characterise what I'm going to say to you, for which I thank my colleagues in advance. So, briefly, because I have 45 minutes and I'm going to have to rattle through a lot of this, what I aim to do is as follows. I'm going to try and think briefly about what led to the outcome of the referendum, consider what happened in the referendum itself, look at what Brexit might mean, what form it could take, and then finally look at what the implications of Brexit might be for, respectively, the British state, the British uh, economy, and British politics. <laughs> so, if you read the massive literature that has appeared since the referendum, dealing with the referendum, you might be excused for assuming that we can explain everything that happened in terms of events between February and June of last year. You read the various memoirs, you read the book by Tim Shipman, they are heroic accounts of how a few politicians tried and either succeeded in or failed in shaping the outcome of this referendum. I firmly believe that whilst obviously the campaigns mattered, the roots of what happened can be found far, far further in the past. And there are two elements to this. The first, perhaps self-evidently, is the history of our relationship with the European Union. And here the first thing I would say is I think the Treaty of Maastricht represented a turning point in the history of those relations in several ways. Firstly, of course, it was the moment when the Tory party became openly, profoundly divided. And you see with the intake of MPs in 1992, including a lot of the figures we saw very prominently in the referendum, like Ian Duncan Smith, that that split became very firm, very real, and was going to affect the Tory party for the foreseeable future. The second thing, which people don't talk about, I think, and which is crucial, is it marked the moment when we split away from other Europeans, because essentially for Britain, from the moment that the single European Act had been signed and ratified in 1987, we became a status quo EU member state. That is to say, we were happy with where we'd got to. And any attempts to go further were irritating for us and difficult for us politically. And Maastricht brought that out into the open with all the talk of political union, all the talk of the F word, and so on. And of course, from Maastricht, what Stephen Bush of the New Statesman calls the drumbeat of Euroscepticism, has been the background of our politics ever since. And you can't explain the referendum without reference to that. And you have the rise of UKIP. You have the activities of the Tory Eurosceptics. And you have a Prime Minister in David Cameron who was always willing to give them concession after concession, as Ken Clark famously said. It's all very well feeding buns to the crocodiles, but you need to be careful if you're going to run out of buns. And essentially, with the Bloomberg speech of 2013, that is what David Cameron did. The third element of the relationship with the European Union is that many of the themes that were central in the referendum weren't plucked out of the air by Matthew Elliott, but had been around and had been prominent in our relations with the EU from the beginning. The issue of control, the issue of sovereignty, had been there since long before we joined and was given real prominence in the 1970s by figures like Tony Benn who Norman Tebbit said gave the best speech ever heard in the House of Commons when he spoke out against EC membership in 1975. The issue of the budget. Money has always been front and centre to the arguments that Britain has had with the European Union. Since it joined, the initial renegotiation was partly about money. The referendum was partly over that. And, of course, Margaret Thatcher came in promising to get our money back. Again, the EU budget had always been a source of friction between Britain and the European Union, and it was something that the Leave campaign managed to play upon very effectively. And the third issue, of course, was immigration. Now, here, this wasn't an issue that was there from the start, because actually in 1975, interestingly enough, people who thought that there was too much immigration into the UK were more likely to vote to remain. 
in the European community. So there is a complete sea change. But certainly and since 2003, 2004, 2004 with the enlargement of the European Union, and remember in 2004, in 2005, the UKIP manifesto spoke about the need to deal with the fact of European integration in the context of our inability to control migration. Immigration has been on the agenda and, in, and increasingly, and this was the success of Nigel Farage, increasingly linked to the issue of EU membership. And the final element of our relationship with the European Union, it's worth taking into account, that predates the formal campaign, is of course the renegotiation that David Cameron carried out. Remember, it was absolutely fundamental to how Tory voters <laughs> behaved that over 140 Conservative MPs eventually came out against the renegotiation by saying they were going to support leaving the European Union. And one of the reasons for this, I think, is because the referendum followed quite closely after a general election. And one of the things that David Cameron rather unwisely did in the general election was to ramp up the rhetoric about what he could achieve because it suited his purposes for May 2015, even though it was to undermine him in June 2016, when he didn't deliver on his renegotiation. So, for instance, in the Tory party conference of October of 2014, Cameron said, I will not take no for an answer on migration. I will get what Britain needs. And of course, eventually, he did take no for an answer on immigration. He didn't get what he thought Britain needed. He didn't even get what he thought he could achieve from the other European member states. And that came back to haunt him in the actions of his other MPs. The other issue that I think is important is the way in which our politics have changed. Now, none of this is rocket science. It's all been written about by many people, prominent amongst them the late, great Peter Mayer, Colin Hay, my former colleague. And here there are several elements that I'll go over quite quickly. The first is the move to the centre ground ideologically, the shift of the Labour Party away from its basis in working class communities towards the centre ground of politics, a shift, I should say, that Roger Jowell had propounded in 1994 when he said Tony Blair needs to appeal to the middle class if he's going to win an election in this country, and he was quite right. I'm not sure he would have fully anticipated the degree to which Tony Blair took his advice and the distance which the Labour Party moved away from its working class roots towards becoming a party of the middle class, both in terms of its political programmes and, of course, in terms of its own membership and composition. The nature of its, of its MPs changed dramatically over the last 20 years. So you have ideological centrism, which led, of course, increasingly commonly in the early 2000s to that accusation you heard, why should I vote? They're all the same. Because the ideological gap between centre-left and centre-right shrank. But also a values convergence. That is to say, the mainstream of British politics con con converged around socially liberal values that were not, as we were to find out, necessarily shared by the bulk of the British population. We didn't quite get to the stage of the Democratic Party, where they had toilet gate, where the party was consumed by arguments about the correct signs to put on the doors of toilets. But nevertheless, you can see elements of the same debate in our politics. And all this led to a combination of things. Voter disengagement in, turn of t in terms of turnout at elections, in terms of membership, in terms of voter volatility, the propensity of members to switch their votes between elections. And of course, on top of all of this, you get specific uh, periods towards the 2009, 2010, including the expenses scandal, the impact of austerity, the Panama Papers, and so on, all of which serve to further strain the public's trust in its political system. Now, by all of this, I'm not for a moment saying the campaigns didn't matter. I'm simply saying that the background was important, not least because the Leave campaign managed to play upon many of the issues I've talked about far, far more effectively than the Remain campaign. So the Leave campaign picked those issues of budget, of immigration, of control. The Leave campaign played very, very effectively on that sense of distrust and disillusionment with politics. Ironic it was indeed to see people like Boris Johnson propounding that the British public vote against the establishment. But nevertheless, it would seem that that had a degree of resonance. And Sarah herself in her recent work has illustrated that distrust of politics increased the likelihood of voters voting to leave the European Union. So all these things played into the campaign, and I think we should be aware of looking at these things in too short a time frame. 
Interestingly enough, research by the British Election Survey and others suggests that actually the fundamental role of the campaign wasn't to change people's minds. There's been a lot of research done uh, that indicates that it might well be the case that Leave had the lead throughout the campaign and that actually very, very few people move from one camp to the other. Um, this puts me in mind of the ninth British Social Attitudes survey where Roger Jowell talked about shy, ch shy Tories and actually claimed that it might well have been in 1992 that Na Labour never had the lead that Neil Kinnock was accused of losing. But what the campaign did do is two things, I think. One, the Leave campaign managed to be effective enough to persuade sufficient numbers of people not to crumble under the combined assault of the British and indeed international establishment. Take your pick. You have the Labour Party, you have the Conservative Party, you have the Bank of England, you have the Treasury, you have Barack Obama, for heaven's sake, ranged on one side. And yet, the British people ignored what those people were saying. And the second thing I think that the Leave campaign did rather effectively was to mobilise its base. 2.8 million voters, around 10% of the population, voted in 2016 who had not voted in the general election of 2015. And the vast majority of those people voted to leave. And most of the stuff about the referendum itself, I think, is pretty well known. That it revealed a country that was profoundly divided by age, by geography, by class, by nation because, of course, two nations voted to remain, two nations voted to leave. And, of course, the issues were relatively predictable. Here are the word clouds from ITV's election night, the left of Leave supporters on the right of Remain supporters. And the striking thing about this diagram, I think, is there's absolutely nothing at all surprising about it whatsoever. It is as you would have expected. And the drivers of the vote at an individual level are more and more well understood. Key to it, of course, is education, but of course also important was age. And here I'm going to do something I don't usually do, which is stand up for young people. Young people are often blamed for not turning out, and their not turning out is often blamed on some of the outcomes we get. 18 to 24 year olds make up only 11% of our voting population, and it would have taken a turnout of 120%, which even I, as a non-quantitative political scientist can tell you it's hard to achieve <laughs> to turn that result round. And even if you rather optimistically define young as under 45, what? it would have required a 97% turnout to overturn the referendum result. So as I say, whilst there are plenty of things to criticise young people for, and I spend most of my time worrying whether my own son can spell X rather than worrying which box he's going to put it in, but there we go. <laughs> You cannot hold them responsible for the outcome of this referendum. Crucially, and I'm going to come back to this later on, one of the things that the referendum revealed, and I talked about social liberalism earlier, was a kind of cultural division in British society. We've seen that in the work of Eric Kaufman, who correlates support very closely, support for leave with support for the death penalty. John himself has written about this when he wrote a piece after the referendum explaining why it was that pollsters maybe didn't get everything right. And one of the points he makes was that actually this is about a new cleavage in British politics, a cleavage between liberals and social conservatives. And because education is key to this difference and because pollsters don't tend to look at educational background, it was very, very hard to understand. And this is something I shall revisit when I'm talking a little bit about politics in the future. But let me just end this section by saying back in, in 2000, in the 17th British Social Attitudes Survey, Roger Jowell showed us how prescient he was when he argued that economics were not the reason why there was a divergence between labour and the traditional working class, but it was rather about social issues, tolerance, morality, traditionalism, prejudice and nationalism. I think the referendum has illustrated in part just how right he was all those years ago. OK, now we've got that out of the way, I can look at John every now and again without feeling quite so naked up here. <laughs> now, having voted to leave, the fact of the matter is Brexit could have meant any number of different things. Think back to last summer, 
when we were talking about soft Brexit, hard Brexit, black Brexit, white Brexit, red, white and blue Brexit, managed Brexit, cliff edge Brexit, orderly Brexit, disorderly Brexit, and of course, dog's Brexit, which is the best of the lot. <laughs> the point about that is that voting to leave wasn't a clear guide to what we should do. Will we be Norway? Will we be Canada? Will we be Switzerland? You heard all those debates. Many, many choices, in other words, were compressed into that binary choice you saw on your voting slip. And credit where credit's due, Theresa May played an absolute blinder. And she played a blinder because in the period since the referendum, she, and I'm fairly convinced it's she and her team, have succeeded in defining what Brexit will mean. It is she who laid down the law at the Conservative Party conference, saying we will not be under the authority of a foreign court, saying there will be no free movement, saying we will not be making large payments to the, Euro to the EU's budget. None of this was, was predefined by the vote. It was all stated by the Prime Minister. And the lack of opposition and pushback against her position has, I think, been absolutely remarkable. Now, you never say never in politics. And one of the interesting things, one of the few interesting things about the Conservative Party's manifesto is that the, the profound optimists amongst you might see a gleam of hope. You might think, oh, there's not a single mention of the European Court of Justice. Has that red line gone? Maybe. I'd be very, very surprised myself. But it looks to me like what Theresa May has done is single-handedly taken this debate by the scruff of the neck and put her own imprimatur on it very, very clearly. And this has massive implications. It means we will be out of the customs union. That is something that the manifesto did clarify. Because for those of you who follow those things, when she made her Lancaster House speech, what she said about the customs union, well, it was slightly barking mad, to be frank. It made no sense. It was internally contradictory. But that has been clarified in the manifesto. And we will be out of the single market. Now, very, very briefly, because I understand that not everyone spends their waking hours obsessing about the European Union, I'm just going to try and tell you what this means, OK? Everyone says customs union and single market. What the customs union allows us to do is to trade with other EU member states without our goods being subjected to tariffs at the border, so that's easy, everyone knows about tariffs, but also without being checked. Now, checking is quite intrusive. If you're shipping a bunch of chemicals over to France or to Germany, if they're being checked because you're outside the customs union, it means samples are taken. It means you have professionals there to test the contents because your stuff isn't certified because you're not in the customs union. It's very, very time consuming to be outside the customs union, okay? So the customs union matters in terms of trade, but then there's the single market. And the single market is about rules, and it matters far, far more in the contemporary world than tariffs. Go back to 1978. In 1978, the French were trying to export a drink, which you may have heard of. Do you know what Cassis de Dijon is? <laughs> yeah? All right. So the French have a drink called Cassis de Dijon, which they make a cocktail called Kier out of, where you basically mix it with white wine. It's a fantastic drink because it tastes like Ribena, and if you have three or four of them, you forget your name. <laughs> so I recommend it most strongly. In 1978, you could not sell Cassis de Dijon in Germany because the Germans had an odd set of administrative rules about alcohol that said, beer has this much alcohol, wine has this much, and schnapps has 100%. And if you're none of these categories, you can't sell your booze here. The French went to the European Court of Justice that said, actually, the Germans are in the wrong. You cannot legally, as a member of the European Union, stop another member state selling its goods unless you can come up with either a public health or a national security reason why not, broadly. OK, I'm simplifying slightly. What that means is that vast array of essentially protectionist regulations that every country has to keep out foreign goods because it's quite good for your own domestic economy, doesn't matter anymore. You can trade across Europe. Now, imagine I make beer, all right, and I want to export my beer to France. Inside the single market, as long as it doesn't kill the French or blow up, so health or national security, <laughs> you're absolutely fine. Outside the single market, once it's been through customs and been syringed out and checked and all that sort of stuff, it gets to France and the French guy on the border says, ha! This looks really nice, but there's a French ordinance dating from 1507 that says beer must be sold in bottles that are this shape. Mm. And actually, your beer's got too much alcohol in it for French beer. So could you go away and produce a different beer in different bottles? You can see immediately what this means for small exporters. 
Okay? And the rules, of course, are different in every member state. So that is what being out of the customs union and the single market means, and that is why it matters so much. I'll come back to that when I talk about the economics. One final thing. This general election is meant to help with Brexit. It is a nonsense. Whatever the size of the Prime Minister's majority after the election, it will not affect our negotiating strength with the other member states, because frankly, they don't care. In fact, there is a literature in political science that suggests the best way to get what you want is to have a tiny majority. Mm. Because then you can credibly go to Brussels and say, look, I'm really sorry, I'm not an unreasonable person, but, you know, as John Major did in 1992, I'm a really reasonable bloke. Michael Howard isn't, and he's promised to bring the government down if I don't get him what he wants. That's how you're strong. If Theresa May turns up in Brussels with a majority of 150 and says, I can do what I want, they're going to say, well, compromise. So it actually, in some ways, weakens her. What it does do, and I'll get back to this again a bit later on, is strengthen her hand when it comes to the legislation she needs to pass prior to Brexit. Because there, her majority at the moment is very suspect, and it would only take a few Tory rebellions to bring into doubt a lot of the legislation that needs to come with the Great Repeal Bill in order for it to be effective. What does Brexit mean for the British state? I would argue that the challenge confronting the, big, the British state is the largest that has ever confronted it in peacetime. And it's the challenge of Brexit. There are several things that needs to happen. I mean, the first thing that needs to happen is that the civil service needs to get back and to maintain its reputation for impartiality, which as the Public Administration and Constitutional Affairs Committee of the House of Commons argued in a report a few months ago, had been damaged by the referendum. The civil service was basically dragged into doing stuff it shouldn't have done during the referendum campaign. And I'm, I'm going to come back to that very, very briefly later on. The second massive challenge it has to take face is dealing with the implications of Brexit for devolution. If you read the manifestos, they are almost biblically unclear on devolution. They make some vague pledges, but clearly none of them, indeed, who does, understands the devolution settlement. But, briefly speaking, what happens when we bring powers back from Brussels, according to the Conservative manifesto, is that they go back to London, and they might have a chat with the devolves about how to wield those powers. But the dev devolution settlement says quite clearly that in areas like agriculture and the environment or fisheries are devolved. So the devolved administrations are thinking, well, when they come back from Brussels, they come to us. And it's up to the civil service and government ministers to tr and, and ministers in the devolved to thrash this out. And there will be an awful lot of thrashing out to be done. Because as the, as the Supreme Court told us in the Article 50 case, basically this is a political, the Sewell Convention is political. So you politicians can sort it out amongst yourselves. That will not be easy and it will not be quick. The next thing that the British state has to deal with is the Great Repeal Bill. This gives me the chance to show you my favourite of all slides. <laughs> that is the European Communities Act. And the European Communities Act would cease to apply in this country on the day we leave the European Union. Okay? What the government has to do is to transpose all of the regulations that the European Union have passed that are relevant to us. So it's not all of them, because some of them deal with Danish merchant seamen or whatever, so it doesn't apply. But all the ones that, appear, that, that apply to us have to be put into British law before we leave or we end up with all sorts of legal vacuums. Okay? Now, a far less interesting photo uh, slide. That is a section of the legislation that applies to air transport. Okay? It is very, very complicated. It is very, very dense. It'll take some transcribing because obviously you've got to be sensitive to context. And crucially, a lot of that legislation includes references to European agencies or the European Court of Justice or the European Commission, which will have to be changed to British authorities for when we leave the European Union. And those sorts of decisions are highly political. This isn't the sort of thing you can do with a stroke of a pen. <laughs> Oh, we'll let Parliament deal with that, shall we? Oh, we'll let the courts deal with that. These things need thought. These things need time. And there are thousands of them to be dealt with. So the challenge, I think, of the Great Repeal Bill cannot and should not be underestimated. And one of the questions that comes out of all of this for me 
is whether British government over the next five years is going to have the bandwidth to do anything else at all. I mean, the Financial Times ran a story about four or five months ago in which they said that the amount of legislation passed in 2016 was a historic low because we were dealing with the referendum, we were dealing with the aftermath of the referendum. Well, it seems to me that over the next 18 months, we'll have far more detailed and complicated stuff to deal with that will be clogging up our legislative and administrative systems. I simply do not know how any government, and, and remember that the party manifestos we've had for this election, I just wonder whether that will be practically possible given the kinds of work that the civil service is going to be doing at a time when its numbers are historically low, remember. And last, the last budget, the Philip Hammond's budget, was interesting in that it expressly ruled out increases of resources to departments like DEFRA. And DEFRA are going to be busy because we can no longer simply implement EU agricultural policy. We have to come up with one on our own within the next 18 to 19 months. The other challenge to the British state, and I'll talk about this very, very briefly, is the challenge to the future of the UK itself. Scotland will almost certainly have a referendum. I'm not going to hazard any guesses about how that's going to go. It seems to me that as important, if not more so, is the implications of Brexit for Northern Ireland uh, in two ways. Firstly, because, of course, the Good Friday Agreement rests on the fact of having an open border between North and South. The nationalists in the North can live with the fact of being in the United Kingdom, even if they don't like it, because actually Ireland looks and feels like one country because there is no hard border between the two. So there are political issues, very important political issues. There are also economic issues. In many ways, the Irish, the two Irish economies are one economy. They are so interdependent. So you hear the stories about the dairy farmers where the cows are in the north and the, the pasteurisations in the south and the bottles are back in the north. Think about what I was saying about customs. Think I was saying about the time it takes. Think I was saying about the possibility of having uh, tariffs, 30-odd percent tariffs on dairy products, I think. And we're not quite sure whether they apply each time you cross the border or just once. But either way there's a lot of dairy farms going to be going out of business. Think about the Republic of Ireland's uh, fruit and vegetable industry. 80% of their fruit and vegetables are exported to the United Kingdom. That works fantastically well when they're not stopped at the borders, when there aren't queues. When there are checks at the borders and when there are queues, the market for rotten cabbage from the Republic of Ireland isn't going to be a thriving one. So there are all these issues about Ireland, both in terms of its economy and in terms of its politics, that need to be resolved, and it's going to take, I suspect, some very, very clever lawyers, not that there aren't any, to do it. What might Brexit mean for our economy? As you'll remember, the Treasury came out with some short-term predictions of what Brexit might mean before the referendum, where they said there would be 500,000 job losses and a year-long recession. I'm no economist, but, but they got it wrong. Absolutely wrong, OK? Consumer confidence hasn't dipped. There haven't been the job losses. Growth has continued at steady, if not exactly impressive, levels. One of the implications of this that I think is fundamental is that the fact the Tory, the, the, tre God, the Treasury's <laughs> short-term predictions were wrong has given carte blanche to supporters of Brexit to <coughs> deduce from that that all economic forecasts are therefore wrong. Why should we believe the people who say that Brexit will be difficult for the British economy? Because they were wrong in the, on the short term. Why shouldn't they be wrong on the long term? When, in response to a Demos paper in March that said that Wales would be one of the worst hit regions of the United Kingdom, a spokesperson in the office of the Tory, uh, of, the, of the leader of the Conservative Party in Wales said, According to Project Fear, we should be holed up in a post-apocalyptic wasteland in threadbare clothes, eating tinned food by now. You see the point. They were wrong about the short term. We don't believe them about the long term either. But this is a fallacy. If there's one thing you do after this lecture, go home and read Jonathan Portes's uh, blog on our website where he looks at the difference between short and long term economic forecasts and compares them to the difference between the study of weather and the study of climate.
Okay? Short-term economics is based on a very, very different set of methodologies to long-term economics. Short-term economics involves predicting the behaviour of millions of consumers in response to external stimuli, and economics, quite frankly, and apologies to any economists who are here, has never been particularly good at that. Trade theory is one of those bodies of economic thought that has become steadily more, more robust over time. And the findings of trade theory, whether it be that actually, this, e this isn't rocket science either, geography is a crucial determinant of trade. So trade with Australia isn't gonna make up for trade with the European Union. <laughs> or that barriers to trade will reduce trade, which in, ter in turn will reduce your economic output domestically, have proved very, very resilient over the years. So I think it's a fallacy to say because the short-term forecasts were wrong, the long-term forecasts were wrong. The problem is that the long-term forecasts are grim. So Swathi Dingra at the LSE has recently done some work on trade, and what her predictions are is in the event of Britain leaving the customs union and the single market, as I said, trade in the first instance, so we're talking about the medium term, one to five years, with the European Union will decrease by 40%, which will lead to GDP being 3% smaller year on year than it would have been had we remained within. By way of contrast, if we sign a deal with the United States that removes every single tariff on every single thing we buy and sell, it will increase GDP by 0.3%. The IFS have predicted that a loss to GDP of that sort of order would lead to public spending having to be £40 billion pounds lower in 2030 than it would otherwise have been. So these are big, big numbers we're talking about. And just to put, give you some context, because Swathi has talked about 3% of GDP, 0.6% of GDP is the net saving we would have from not paying into the EU budget. Okay, so we bank that cash, which is the actual figure, not the 350 million. It's a slightly smaller figure. Okay, so it's the net from the EU budget. It's 0.6% of GDP. And again, using my quantitative hat, that is smaller than 3%. <laughs> so... The other thing I should say, and the other point worth making, is that above and beyond trade, the other key plank of this Brexit is, of course, to reduce migration. And the OBR recently came, OBR last November, calculated that if we reduce net migration by 80,000, it will lead to a fiscal shortfall of £6 billion pounds a year by 2021, in all sorts of ways. Key jobs not being filled, and of course tax revenues. The figures for 2015 are quite stark. EU migrants in the United Kingdom paid £3 billion in taxes, took out £5 billion in benefits. That's not the whole story, of course, because it doesn't account for things like schooling and health. But overall, it's abundantly clear that in terms of the exchequer, these people paid in more than they took out. So reducing migration is going to reduce the tax take. OK? And finally... In perhaps the ultimate irony, there's been a lot of really good work done on the basis of, in, of output data that is regional in nature on what the specific regional effects of Brexit might be in the United Kingdom. And there is an almost uncanny correlation between the scale of the impact and the degree to which a region voted to leave. London and Scotland will be relatively untouched in economic terms by Brexit. Scotland because its levels of trade with the EU are relatively low. London because it's global. A lot of London's economic activity is not just with the European Union, it's with the world as a whole. The parts of the United Kingdom that are going to suffer disproportionately, according to this economic model from Brexit, will be the West Midlands, Yorkshire and Humberside, South Wales and the North East. The areas, in other words, that voted to leave the European Union. And I will come back to that in a minute because I think it's absolutely fundamental to the future of our politics. Now, this is going to be speculative and therefore it's going to be quick. And I'm basically just going to discuss some of the big issues I think that the events of the last couple of years have thrown up. One is whether or not we now have a Brexit split in our politics, on top of or instead of the traditional splits between the parties. Sorry, I didn't know I was going to do this, but this okay. is some of her research, uh, which shows that actually there is some evidence 
that there is a sort of lever remainer identity that is springing up in British politics. And of course, if that is the sort of social division I talked about earlier, it cuts through parties and across parties and makes it very hard for parties to deal with the state of public opinion. And of course, there's been a lot of stuff written recently of the relievers, which sounds a little bit scatological to me, but anyway, the relievers being the people who voted to remain in the European Union, but now think that we should leave, because actually that's what we voted to do. Uh, where that goes, I do not know. It seems from the polling to date that it's not quite as profound a cleavage as the Liberal Democrats had hoped at the start of this campaign. Uh, but actually, I would say it is far, far too soon to tell. One of the interesting things at the moment, of course, is the fact that the Conservatives are desperate to, for it to be real and they want this campaign to be totally about Brexit. And one of the more interesting things, in fact, the only interesting thing that happened yesterday, because I also watched the debate, was... <laughs> Just prior to the debate, Tory central office and Labour central office sent out questions in a press release to journalists saying, this is what you should be asking the other candidate. Labour sent out six questions and none of them were about Brexit. The Tory sent out ten and every single one, every single question the Tories wanted us to ask Jeremy Corbyn was about Brexit. That just goes to show how the two parties are playing this election in very, very different ways. The other, and I think equally profound issue, is that we seem to have entered an era where economics, what is good for the economy, is no longer the single most important driver of our politics. Because we have embarked on a course, deliberately and self-consciously, which will make our economy smaller. Now, I'm not saying this is wrong, and one of the few obviously and refreshingly honest things said during the referendum campaign was said, was said by Nigel Farage when he was asked, but won't cutting migration make our economy smaller? And he said, maybe, but there are more important things than money. That's absolutely fair enough, but it is interesting nonetheless, and there are very, very important questions to be asked about whether all those people who voted to leave were really, as Philip Hammond put it, voting to make themselves poorer. But that, I think, is going to be interesting to see how it plays out, if there are other issues. I mean, it might be that Theresa May's idea that fairness trumps all else is what drives this government forward. But it marks a sea change in our politics, as does the potential that the values clash that we saw in the referendum continues. And I have to say again that certainly prior to the beginning of last week, Theresa May had played a blinder in terms of appealing to the kinds of sentiment that we saw at play in the referendum campaign. Her particular form of populism, which is, involves on the one hand the scapegoating of the European Union, of courts in this country, and of citizens of the world amongst others, a real populist ring to that, whilst at the same time promising state intervention to help those hardest off. She had an ear for the popular mood, I think which was very, very impressive indeed, and is not matched by her skills as a campaigner. <laughs> <laughs> Looking forward, though, I think one of the problems the Conservatives... If you imagine that the Conservatives get a large majority that includes not just traditional Tory heartlands, but also traditional Labour seats, <coughs> one of the problems is going to be managing a co an electoral coalition that effectively stretches from the Labour Party all the way through to UKIP. Because remember, when you get new MPs in Parliament, the town I grew up in, Wakefield, has been Labour for 83 years, is about to elect a Tory, I think, all right? But once you get a Tory MP for Wakefield, you have a voice in Parliament who says, Prime Minister, you can't forget your plans about the worse off in society or I won't be re-elected. The arithmetic in Parliament changes. The tensions within the parliamentary party change. It's going to be a very, very hard party to govern and to lead because its ideological scope is going to be so great. So that, I think, is the issue facing the Conservatives. I suppose I could have done a whole lecture in itself on the problems facing the Labour Party, but let me just say a couple of things very, very quickly. Corbyn, it seems to me, is obviously one of the problems, but he's only one of the problems. Corbyn and his staff and their inefficiencies and Corbyn himself are obviously problematic for the Labour Party. There are two other things, I think, that are problematic for the Labour Party, too. Two I would just simply describe as hubris. That is to say, the tendency in the Labour Party to treat their core electoral areas as if they were theirs forever. Kind of, who else would they vote for sort of mentality that came to a sorry end in Scotland. When you hear the stories about, oh, we haven't seen our MP in years, you know, we just vote for him, he doesn't come here. 
Uh, and actually, you hear very, very similar things. I was back in Wakefield uh, doing some interviews last week, and you heard very, very similar things said about, uh, said about the Labour Party. Very similar things, incidentally, to the things you hear in industrial France about the Socialist Party, in those parts of France that voted Front National quite strongly in the recent election. And the third thing, of course, that the third problem the Labour Party faces is, of course, Brexit. Whoever was the leader of the Labour Party would have struggled to deal with a situation when you are a party whose constituencies include the five that most voted most strongly leave and the five that voted most strongly remain. Managing that is a nightmare, whoever you are. I should point out at this point that Roger Jowell rejected the line that Labour is finished throughout the 1980s, so maybe we could do some with some of his optimism now. But two more quick points before I conclude. One... As I said before, one of the things that was swirling around our politics before the referendum was a loss of trust, a loss of faith in politics. The referendum did nothing to stop that, quite the contrary. You have the ridiculous side to former ministers like Ian Duncan Smith calling the Treasury the worst thing in this country. You have a Leave campaign that trained its guns on the institutions, including the Bank of England. And it will be interesting to see whether that has a long-term impact in people's faith in those core institutions of the British state. What I would say is an awful lot hinges on how the economic fallout of Brexit is dealt with by the Prime Minister. Where the pain falls is going to be one of the big questions of the next few years. Because assuming, as even some pro-leave economists do, that Brexit in the short term is going to be economically painful, where, who suffers most as a result of that is a crucial question. And the other crucial question is where the what the narrative is. The blame game is beginning already. We blame the Europeans for negotiating hard with us. We blame Remainers for talking the country down. The blame game has started and politically how that plays out and who ultimately carries the can for the consequences of Brexit, if they're, as nervous, if they're as negative as these economists have made out, is going to be fundamental to how our politics moves on. So in conclusion, Brexit is going to impact on our politics, on our economics, and our society. It will change our system. It will change our political economy, I think, in ways we have not witnessed before in peacetime. There is an unprecedented churn in our politics. David Butler said the other day, on Twitter, no less, that the poll movements of late have been the biggest since 1945 in an election campaign. One thing I would say is that all of this represents a, both a challenge and an enormous opportunity for the social scientists. This kind of change is where us social scientists have come into our own. And I think if social scientists can't achieve impact and engagement now in the world we live in at the moment, they never will be able to. And let me at this point express my profound gratitude for the SRC to, for allowing the UK and the changing Europe to try and do this a little bit. For those of you who came here expecting predictions, this is the moment when I finally disappoint you. There's far too much going on, and I simply don't know. But I will hide behind the man after whom this lecture is named in my cowardice. Receiving the Descartes Prize in 2005, and it was the first time that a social scientist has been awarded this prize, Roger Jowell said, he didn't say that. <laughs> I'll let you read that for yourselves. People are opinionated in a way that their counterparts in the natural world are not. They are capable of believing one thing and doing quite another. Well, what I say in conclusion is amen to that. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.